thing, how many of you could relate that particular essay um, to, say, a research we've read on every day show um, and some of the other continental thinkers? And when I read it, um, oh, look, you didn't make me some of the plugs. Yeah. It's a wild comprehension. Let me. The paper is excellent, and I want to have your permission to read it. Oh, you that you read it, okay? Yeah, I read it. Yeah, because, it, because when we get to the Baba Kama, because it, I think it integrates okay. good things. It's great. So you have, you okay with that? I uh, Sure. Okay, good. I'm just happy it's good. I was a little afraid that I missed the point. So ah. This is a relief. <laughs> All right. So, uh, well, let, I don't want to, because other people don't have the same kind of back, maybe we can have that kind of a discussion uh, separately. Uh, he was very much involved in natural logic, and, uh, and it, it just raised, very, that was it. Could you please repeat the title of the essay? Yeah, it was, I think it's on, it's on chalk. Oh, it's on chalk. So, it, yeah, it's What is a Question uh-huh. by Felix Cohen. Uh, part of it is very logical. Um, he's trying to figure out, from a logical point of view, what is the structure of a question? What is a question in logical terms? Um, I, it's not scanned. Um, it was simply sent as, a, I think, either a PDF or as an attachment. So, but you should be able to find it. So what I wanted to do, I think a lot of people have been coming in on different aspects from different uh, angles, um, from different points of strength. But uh, I wanted to very briefly uh, pick up on a couple of issues on the material from Pesachim that deals with the laws of Passover, since this is the uh, season to speak about these things. And I wanted um, to deal with a, a couple of general considerations. Those, anybody who really wants to have a, a serious initiation, you should speak with Svi and he'll go over his paper, which was um, a, a quite excellent analysis of the Mishnah and the structure. So it was. Um, uh, but I, I want to kind of pick up on some issues that will kind of bring us all together in terms of our um, collective um, work uh, and just point out a couple of uh, larger issues because both here and with Baba Kama, I want to keep it at a level where we can all have a shared discussion and I don't want to presume um, any specialized knowledge because we're, trying, we're really trying to ask uh, cultural questions more than um, uh, technical questions, although that's sometimes the way one has to uh, get into the, uh, the problem. So let me just first make a couple of points about the Mishnah, and then we'll jump to the Gemara. The Mishnah, as you all know, is the normative rabbinic ruling from the Tanaitic period. That means the final editor is Rabbi Judah the Prince, Yehuda HaNasi, roughly around 210 of the Common Era. It has various other kinds of editions. It's the oral normative tradition, and very rarely is there any citation of the written tradition. The recapitulation or the justification of that in terms of the or of the written Torah is part of the Gemara's project, even though it may use earlier material, and that is essentially a, an Amoraic tradition. It uses early ones. That means it begins after the year 210. From our point of view, it'll be the tradition as it came down to into Babylonia and so on. So the first kind of logic, I want to just kind of just mention a couple of quick things about the Mishnah to see what the, prob- what the larger problem, cultural problem is for the Gemara and how, it de- how questions are functioning there. So the first thing I just want you to see from the beginning, those of you who have the, uh, the Hebrew text uh, for the Mishnah or the, uh, the Aramaic text for the Gemara, you can keep it in front of you. You see that we have a kind of normative statement of something that has come down in the oral tradition, and it states explicitly there are various things 
that are connected with Passover, the Paschal offering, right? Things that are connected with the Paschal offering, which override um, the Sabbath. So that's the first kind of um, contrast. And um, one of the major ones, of course, is what's called here in the English, uh, with the, the Hebrew shechita, which is the slaughtering of the Paschal offering. And that overrides the Sabbath. And, and, and what you can see here, that it's stated in an apodictic fashion, right? It's stated as an apodictic law. Now, it doesn't say if such and such, if if the Sabbath comes on the same day as the festival, then um, the, Sabbath, the festival overrides. It's stated as an apodictic normative tradition. And you can see um, that there's a, um, a, a distinction that is um, uh, given here. We have the, the shechita and the sprinkling of the blood and the cleansing, etc., and the burning of the fats. Now it says, but it's roasting, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We have a number of other kinds of considerations, um, which are stated that they um, do not override the Sabbath. So you have a general positive norm, and then you have some negative issues, most of which are dealing with what we would call kind of rabbinic restrictions, rabbinic legislation, and is presented um, in those terms. And then we have differences of opinion regarding these latter issues, right? Okay, so we had, and it's trying to make different kinds of justification. Now, I just want to uh, mention two or three things. Uh, although you have in the translation um, the teaching of Rabbi Eliezer presented as a question. You could read that simply as a positive um, assertion. So I don't want to deal with it precisely as a question. But the real issue is that you have between the difference between Rabbi Eliezer and Rabbi Joshua is how do you um, establish the justification of that, do you use the law of labor of the Sabbath as a restriction that then uh, is compared to a rabbinic leniency, which is called the Shavuot? Um, and because you're lenient about a very strict law, namely you can't do certain kinds of labors um, on the Sabbath, but if you can do it on the Passover, um, uh, then do you have a kind of leniency? Or do you follow the flip side, which is Rabbi Joshua's position? Do you say, do you use the rabbinic restriction to qualify um, the other norm so that you, you get an even more, you have a more restricted norm? So the question is going back and forth. Do you have the melacha or labor of Sabbath that is used to open up the leniency of other kinds of labors, or is a rabbinic ruling so strict that it acts in reverse to restrict a biblical um, uh, prohibition? They go back and forth of those issues. I don't want to get involved in the technicalities, but you can see that they're having trouble establishing which way to go in the argumentation. And the tradition has left these things, in a certain sense, as an open-ended discourse. And you'll notice that when Rabbi Akiba comes in at the very end to present a general rule, he does two quite surprising things. One thing, he states what was already stated in the Mishnah, <laughs> stated earlier, right? He simply goes and says that the, um, uh, that, that the sh that is what he wants to do is to make a pragmatic distinction between before the Friday night and after, because the issue wasn't resolved so clearly on the basis of the logic. And within this tradition, he firstly says, 
things that can be done before the Sabbath have to be done before the Sabbath. And once the Sabbath comes in, uh, then the only thing that's permitted is the slaughtering of the Paschal offering. But he doesn't provide an, argu an argument for it, although there's an argument for it earlier. Here in the general, he doesn't provide an argument for it. He just simply recites the Mishnah. And then at the end, he uh, simply um, makes his own apodictic claim which had no precedent before that if you don't do it before the setting of the sun, namely a, uh, a rabbinic ruling, you can't carry that over. Okay? So let's leave all of that on the table. And the issue that we want to, that is taken up over and over again as the major cons questionable concern for the sages is how do you justify the oral norms that come down in the Mishnah? What is the nature of communal and cultural justification of the norms? Are they only to be dealt with on the basis of biblical proof, logical proof, oral tradition, or even as we'll see, semi-prophetic tradition? So the whole task of our ensuing Gemara, which is extremely interesting, is to deal with a classical question of authority. The whole issue is what is the nature of the authority? And the reason why this is set up in such a powerful way is you see what it's, it begins. It says, uh, uh, so take, those of you who have the, uh, the text with the Gemara, it says, to know Rabbanan. So we have a very early tradition that is going back to Tanaitic times, right? That the halacha was forgotten by certain people in a particular community, okay? And there was an occasion when the onset of the Passover began with the Sabbath and they didn't know what to do. So the reason, so part of the whole movement will be to say, will be to try to justify or reconstruct the legitimacy of the Mishnah. In other words, they forgot the simple teaching of the Mishnah that the Paschal offering overrides the Sabbath. Now, as we're not, the early part of the discussion is not all the technicalities of whether you can get rid of a wart by an indirect manner or whether you can carry things from certain distances, which were certain rabbinic rules, but the very basic principle was forgotten, right? So, as we'll see as we go through, the, the whole concern of this reconstructed literary form is to show indirectly that the Mishnah can be reconstructed from a whole variety of other points of view and in a certain way is legitimate, but it has to be reconstructed when it's forgotten, okay? And it'll be reconstructed in different ways. So you see now that the opening move of the people in the town of, Bnei, of the Bnei Batera will say, is there any person who knows whether the Passover arrives the Sabbath or not? Okay? So that was the straightforward Mishnah. So now the question is, how can you find this rule? We're going to see how they're going to reconstruct it. And they then naturally, paradoxically, are going to turn to Hillel because they're going to show that a ba the Babylonian tradition wants to show that a Babylonian is a legitimate reconstructor of the tradition even though he studied and learned the tradition in the land of Israel. So there is a presumption that the Babylonian tradition, and you'll notice at the beginning, Hillel is going to give very complicated legal reasoning, which would be the assumption of the legal reason that would be going on in Babylon. It's, it's the land of Israel reasoning, but before he claims his oral connection with the tradition of Shemaiah and Avtalion, the two great sages of that generation, he 
tries to reconstruct this on the basis of rabbinic logic. So he becomes, as it were, a parody or an exemplum of the Babylonian tradition that are using hyper-reasoning to construct what should be the halakha in this case. If it's forgotten and the oral tradition is no longer available, they're trying in the first instance through this question to get at the notion, is this simply a non-logical case of a tradition that come down or can you reconstruct it on the basis of rabbinic logic? In other words, can you reconstruct the biblical basis for the Mishnaic norm which does not have a stated biblical precedent? Okay? Yeah. A question about how the oral tradition works. I mean, is the Mishnah, is it something that is memorized verbatim and passed on from one person to another? Or are we talking According about to the standard tradition, it's passed on as an oral tradition. But the question that arose very early was are there, were there originally biblical precedents for the Mishnah? And the rabbis are simply trying to reconstruct it at a later date. Or were there none? And we simply have to accept it as the basis of an oral tradition. Right? You accept it as an oral tradition, but there is a presumption that Moses already, by, the, by a certain level of the tradition, was taught the logical or scriptural basis of it. Since most of that had been forgotten, that's the job of the Gemara to reconstruct. So they may go in different directions because there's no final proof. They're, tra- they're all trying to reconstruct what would have been the presumptive authority, biblical authority for it. But the Mishnah doesn't provide that authority. So our whole move here is to provide a culture of authority where that authority is lacking its traditional basis. So then you can see the key questions that arise. Uh, first, is there a man who knows whether the Passover rides the Sabbath or not? Okay. So that's the first key question because the mission is forgotten and as we're going to try to see, the Mishnah can be reconstructed on a whole variety of ways and that will take us all the way down to the final tradition of how the people enact um, their tradition too. Then, so they come to him and they say, do you know, I'm going to do the English so you can look at the, um, the Gemara if you want. Do you know whether the Passover rides the Sabbath or not? And then he answers. First he answers on the basis of just general normal logic, right? That is to say, I mean, what, you're asking me an absurd question that any child should be able to figure out because there are numerous cases of daily sacrifices on the Sabbath or on the festivals and you should be able to make that inference on your own. He's, he's, not, he's just saying that is a kind of a general inference that you could make on your own on the basis of natural logic. You don't need specialized rabbinic logic. That's what he says. That's why he says, surely we have many more than 200 Passovers during the year which override the Sabbath. In other words, cases where we perform sacrifices on the Sabbath. So why is this a problem? Right? But then they ask the second key question. Okay? So they ask, the second key, the key uh, question is how do you know it? What is its uh, basis uh, and its legit, uh, legitimation? Okay? So that's the question of Minayinlach. How do you have it? What's the basis of your reasoning? Whenever that is asked, The concern now is to reconstruct this on the basis of biblical text and rabbinic logic. Okay? Now we won't go into all the technicalities, but two forms of technical rabbinic logic are offered. One, and by the way, both of these cases 
much of this logic was known in the Greek rhetorical schools. We now know that the forms of reasoning, which are called the midot shehatorah nidreshet vahen, the rabbinic hermeneutical rules, can be were found already in Greek and Latin rhetorical traditions. So presumably, they were absorbed in the rhetorical schools of the rabbis who were studying Greek and Latin, and they adapted rhetorical techniques to their own teaching of Torah. And then they gave it their own explanation. But the two that we have here, one is what's called Gezeira Shava, which means there is a parallelism of similar terms. Okay? So one parallelism of similar terms is bimoado on its occasion. So that is used with respect to the normal um, tamid offering, which is offered on a, reg- on a daily basis, right? And it's also used with regard to the Passover. Now, it's a little bit of shaky logic, but the, but the argument would be that if it says bemoado and you can perform a sacrifice and you can do that any time of the year, obviously you could do that on Passover, which is moado is very specific. So they're using an argument where the two terms are equivalent, but actually the logical structure is not equivalent. Because in the first case, they're trying to argue that because if Moado on its appointed time can appear on any day of the uh, uh, any day, but it specifically appears on the Passover, um, you could argue in a different way. But they want to use that as one form. The second is the so-called Kal uh, Vechomer or the A Fortiori. So that so the issue now you can see. Uh, the, it's, uh, it's ad manori ad maius, or the from the from the lesser to the greater um, argument. So look how the argument goes, right? It follows a minori or kal. If the tamid that if you don't perform the daily sacrifice that has to go on twice a day, you would be subject to karet, which is the rabbinic penalty of excision according to the rabbis that you punished in the world to come. It's different from the biblical law of karet. How much the more so that if you don't do the uh, 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 sacrifice of uh, 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 the Passover, um, which would uh, be uh, punished by karet, that you, you have to do it on the Sabbath. So that has a more logical progression to it. But again, you notice they're arguing in the second case not on the basis of similar terms which may have their own problematic logic in relationship to each other, but in relationship to a lesser to a greater principle. So if with respect to a lesser principle, if you don't do it, you'd be punished, how much the more so with respect to a more important sacrifice, if you don't do it, you'd be punished. Therefore, quid pro quo, QED, you have to do it. Okay, so now now he gives these two arguments. So notice what happens now. He gives these two arguments and they immediately establish him um, over the... um, over them, right? It's interesting, as you see, that in the first instance, they don't accept his authority because he studied with Shmaya and Aftalion, right? They'll only come back to this later. So the, 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 we see that our, our passage is constructed literarily. Right? They don't accept his authority simply as having received the oral tradition. They want to first show that you could actually reconstruct. Now, we don't know whether, and as what's never stated is presumably the argument would prove, yes, the Sabbath, the Passover overrides the Sabbath. Right? That's the presumption that you could reconstruct it on the basis of rabbinic logic. Okay? So it's interesting that in the construction of this, they don't simply go first to tradition. They say that he studied with the great ones, but that's only used to give him 
uh, the right to answer certain kind of questions, right? So uh, they say, how do you know that? And he gives these two uh, uh, notions, and they immediately make him their patriarch, their nasi. And then it says he sat all the day and expounded the laws of the Passover. Okay? So that the whole issue um, is that it's, it, 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 what's important here in, in, the, in the text, actually, and they switch back to the Hebrew, not to the Aramaic. So the notion that he was lecturing is not correct. Now he was giving midrash halacha the whole time. Okay, he was he. So what you have to understand what this means in this rabbinic context. It means that he was giving biblical reasons for the traditions that he was expounding, okay? So again, we see him as an expositor of the halachic tradition in both cases. And then, you see, he rebukes them. And he, inclu- he says that the reason that they forgot was because they did not properly serve the two masters of the oral tradition. Knows you wouldn't have needed all of this reconstruction if you had not, if you had paid attention to the oral tradition of Shmaya and Avtalion, which now adds a very interesting notion of rabbinic authority. The new notion that's implied of rabbinic authority here is the oral tradition is purely an oral tradition. And logical justification is only done when there is a problem of proof. But if you had paid attention to the oral tradition from the beginning, you would not need this secondary mechanism to show that it was based on scripture. And so presumably implied here is an old discussion Right? There is a discussion of, is, does the oral tradition stand only on its own, and it has its authority since the time of Moses, and descends throughout all the generations, and it could be reconstructed on the basis of logic, but that's not its primary necessity. It stands on its own as an independent, valid structure of authority. That's, I think that's the force of what he is saying. If you had paid attention to these, or to, the, to the Shmata, to the oral tradition by itself, you would need to do uh, Midrash. You would not need, which is, you wouldn't need to do Halachic Midrash. You do that because you're trying to reconstruct something that you're not taking only on faith. So this is a very different argument than the legal exercises that we normally find in the Talmud, which are always trying to find the reconstructed notion because they want to reestablish on the basis of rabbinic, biblical authority. But here you can see that had not yet become a form of the structure of rabbinic authority. There was simply the oral tradition, and then there is this ad hoc logic, which is not natural logic, it is rabbinic logic, so it's a special form of logic, but it's reconstructing it to show you that there's no contradiction between the oral tradition and the written tradition but the oral tradition has simply given it to you in an apodictic way and not in an argumentative way. So here already we can begin to see a difference between the earlier rabbinic authority wanted to present the oral tradition as totally distinct from the rabbinic, from the argumentative tradition as something uniquely distinctive to the rabbinic tradition. I would guess, and I put this in parenthesis, we have a couple of cases that appear in the Midrash, 
Tanchuma, where the distinction, they, they say there are several distinctions between the Jews and the Christians. One is the Sabbath, and it, it arose once the Bible was translated into Greek. So they say, well, what makes, if they now have the Bible in Greek, what makes us distinctive from them? And they give a variety of different answers. And then one answer, there's three different answers, but one answer is, but we have Mishnah and oral tradition, and it is Mistorin. As they're using the language that Paul used, it's what is our mystery. In other words, that the mystery of the rabbinic tradition is the mystery of the oral tradition that only Jews have as a initiation ritual, as it were. It's their tradition. Now, the Jews, Christians, Gentiles can all have the written tradition, even when it's translated. But only the Jews will have the oral tradition because it's a mistorin. The other mistorin is the Sabbath and circumcision. And these were the three issues that were contention between Jews and Christians in the early centuries. Why so, Why because, because that's the language that Paul used. It say? means the mysteries, the sacred mysteries. In other words, it's a, it's a, it's a spiritual, it's a spiritual um, has a spiritual dimension. So there's clearly a polemic here. I would guess, and this is purely a guess, that one of the reasons for keeping the Mishnah separate was to preserve something special that the rabbis wanted to have, that the oral tradition is from sage to sage, and it's preserved as an oral sacred tradition. Only at a later point was there a need to constantly reconstruct it in relationship to scripture, and that probably arose because people challenged whether they are dichotomous or they are related. It's a, it would be a later cultural need to show that they're not two separate traditions, but they're actually brought together. Okay? You, you had a question. Yeah. Okay, you had a question first. Yeah. Um, are you saying that this reference to uh, Shemaya and Talion is part of the earlier tradition that is trying to maintain a separation or a development of the later tradition insofar as it like dignifies the mission by assuming that it of course has a scriptural basis but that's not the point. Shemaya and Aftalion are what called the Zugot. Right. So in the early rabbinic tradition, after you have the tradition from Moses to Joshua to the elders, etc., etc., then you have the pairs, the, the earliest rabbinic Groups came down in Zugot as pairs. Shmai and Avtalion were one of the earliest pairs. They are actually an interesting because they both Avtalion is a Greek name, and they presumably reflect a kind of a Greek ambience at the time. But my point is that they're saying that they were preserving the authentic oral tradition without any intervention of midrashic logic. So the various questions that they're raising now, how do you know it? Is antithetical to like... Right, because you would say, we know it because we have it as a shmua, as an oral tradition from Shmai and Aftalion. But they don't present it like that. They first give us the logic, and then he goes on to say, if, I, um, now if you hadn't been uh, so lazy and listened to them, you wouldn't need me to reconstruct the tradition. So you're getting an interesting cultural take on the fact that rabbinic midrashic procedure in this case to is a reconstructed thing because the people did not pay attention to the original oral tradition and it was forgotten. Now we then have... So now notice what happened. Because you did not serve the two greatest masters, to serve, le shamesh, means you didn't follow them around and hear everything they said orally. Had you done this, so now that he could have said this at the beginning, but now he's saying it later. He said, you're, you're driving me crazy with being doresh kol hayom, 
to giving Midrash with all this reconstruction is because you were lazy and you didn't listen to the first of the Zugot, of the very first. In other words, Shema Yenachtalion are the, the first of the rabbinic sages after you come down from the biblical tradition or when you get down to the end of the biblical tradition, the beginning of the Hellenistic period is Shema Yenachtalion. So they are the essential link to the Mosaic tradition that comes down in the biblical period. That's why they're singled out as uh, in this. So we say, now, what's interesting, then they said to him, now notice what's, what's going to happen. Oh, you, want, you had a question. I'm sorry. Sure. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I think the epistemic significance is pr- that, uh, that, let's just say what can we deduce from this reconstructed narrative all that we could recon- do, can, can deduce is they want to show that if the sa- Passover fell on a Sabbath Eve Okay, and they didn't know what to do, right? And they assumed there may have been an oral tradition, but they didn't have the oral tradition. So what they had to do was use scripture to reconstruct it. So the epistemic significance here is that you can reconstruct a divine oral tradition that comes down through the generations, that's purely oral. It's a pure isnad, it's shalshelet Kabbalah. It's a pure oral tradition from sage to sage, so you can trust it. But that was broken, and you can reconstruct it, which is then to say that the logical tools and the language of scripture are there to be reconstructed but we don't know if that's the truth or not. In other words, we reconstruct it by a whole lot of different ways because in a certain sense it's asymptotic. We don't know that that's... And as we're trying to reconstruct it as best we can. So therefore you often will have more than one rabbinic logical pursuit. Right? If you simply had the oral tradition it would be absolute. The fact that you have multiple logical constructions means that you're having attempts to reconstruct. So it has epistemic power, but it is inferior to the oral tradition, but that has has been a break with the oral tradition. Had they been pious and simply listened to the oral tradition, there there wouldn't be any gap in the law. The only, now that there is a gap in knowledge and you have to know what to do, Scripture, God has provided in the language of Scripture the means for the logical reconstruction of it. But that's only if you accept the rabbinic forms of logic and then there are different kinds of logic and which is going to have the strongest significance. But you see it's present. Let me just go through the, uh, the end of this and then I then speak to we'll see this. So now, notice the next question. The next question is master. So they, this is one of the many questions that had been asked him all day long. Right? And he is he's giving them the devil why they didn't pay attention to Shmaya and Avtalion, so they're wasting his time, they're driving him crazy. Right? I could have stayed home and then would I, I could help my wife prepare for Passover. <laughs> so, so he's saying, now notice what happens. The only question that's isolated to be specified is, Master, if a man forgot and did not bring a knife on the eve of the Sabbath. That's going back to the problematic of the issue of the Tehum. That's going back to our Mishnah. In other words, they were able to reconstruct the issue of the logic of whether the Sabbath and the Paschal offering 
it overrides the Sabbath. And now it's interesting that the people who constructed this, what's called the sugya, or this rabbinic pericope, this rabbinic discussion, this narrative, because it's presented, it's a reconstructed historical narrative, but it's highly tendentious. It's a reconstructed narrative that, whose tendency is to legitimate the oral tradition of the Mishnah. So now they've been able to reconstruct the opening statement that the pas- that this Paschal offering on a Sabbath is- overrides. But now the issue that arose is the second problem that Akiva wrote. What, what happens if they didn't prepare something before the Sabbath? Can, what do you do? So remember, that was a distinction. The lenient position would be you could override the tuchum, that is to say the boundary, and carry something fr- into the temple on the Sabbath because it would be the notion of rabbinic shvut. It's just a rabbinic leniency. And it would be incorporated into the larger prohibition uh, or the larger need to perform the sacrifice. Right? So it's interesting that that was one of the bones of contention. Can you go from one sphere to the other and does a rabbinic ordinance override or doesn't it override? That is precisely the only problem that's now isolated in this reconstructed narrative, right? What do you do if you forgot to bring a utensil, a a knife, to the temple on that particular Sabbath you didn't do it in the afternoon because that was Akiba's ruling. So you would have to. So Akiba was giving us an apodictic teaching. He didn't give us any justification, right? We saw that there was a difference of opinion about these issues between Rabbi Eliezer and Rabbi Joshua, which re- which required Rabbi Akiba to simply give his own apodictic reason. He made a pragmatic distinction, not in base of logic. You do it beforehand. If you don't do it on time, it's done. You, you can't do it. Okay? But this... So now notice what happens. Now Hillel says, I've heard this, but I've forgotten it. In other words, it's the same situation with the B'nai B'tera. Now the rabbis explain this, and the way this continues, I won't go on, is because of anger. Like Moses, when he was angry, he forgot the halachot. Anger makes a person unfit to be a teacher. And because he got angry, he forgot the tradition. So the notion that he was rebuking means that he, in his anger, he forgot the tradition. There's a whole long tradition that reconstructs the moral presupposition underlying this. But, and it'll pick up at the very end of this, but when, I don't want to go into that. But let me just, so he says, I've heard the law, but I have forgotten it, right? So the same thing of shachach. So now notice the irony that is being constructed with the beginning of the sugya, of the pericope. The B'nai B'tera forgot, and they had to reconstruct it on the basis of Hillel's logic. Now Hillel forgets it, even though he served Shmai and Avtalion. So what do you then do? So notice we've had a series of cultural logics that have arisen so far. You have the absolute oral tradition, either Shmai and Avtalion or you have the Mishnah. You have the reconstruction on the basis of biblical words to construct biblical logic. Um, and then, and then you have Akiba, uh, Akiba's tradition that you just make an ad an ad hoc pragmatic ruling that's neither based on authority of scripture or authority of the oral tradition. It's just a human decision that he makes to cut the Gordian knot of an impossible logical problem. And now we have a fourth powerful issue. He says, notice this, he says, you know, Israel, leave it to the people. If then in if they're not full prophets, they have prophetic inspiration. 
So the notion here now is of an extraordinary thing that we mostly find in the Middle Ages, but we see it already here. You trust a pious person to spontaneously come up with a solution. In other words, piety and spiritual rectitude, because you want to obey, people will find a solution. In other words, you have solutions that come not from heaven, but from the ground up because of piety. See, so one was an oral tradition that is the epistemic status was coming from heaven as an oral tradition. The second is a double tradition where you have rabbinic text, which is a divine, uh, the biblical text, which is a divine text, but rabbinic logic, which is a human construction, right? And then you have, in this case, so in these cases, you have, that's between you know, a mixture of the two, and now you have a case where it begins down below and God confirms it, as it were. And so, the people solve it because they're pious and they find a common sense solution which has now the status of semi-prophetic authority. That is to say, you know, it's not a problem. We'll just stick the knives into the sheep and the sheep can go and we're not carrying it and the sheep are walking by themselves. We're not carrying the sheep because there was a question, can you carry a sheep? Is it a living thing or is it a thing? Since uh, a sheep is a thing and not like a human being, you can, right? You couldn't carry it. A human being who could normally walk, you could carry. But an animal is like a thing, so it's like a dead object and you can't carry it, right? It doesn't have the status of a human being. So now what they do is you, you couldn't normally carry the knife, but you're shepherding the sheep, you're not carrying the sheep. They solve the problem in one go. And then, notice what he says, there's a famous thing. You know, um, he, he saw this for his kir halacha. So he knows he saw what people were doing and he remembered the halacha. So here we have a further type of authority, right? A further type of reconstruction. Was, you know, they're say, he's saying, notice what, because this is a whole literary construction. So this final form of authority is that what the people did through their own pious spontaneity was actually the original halakha. That yes, you can do that, and that came down in the halakha which you don't have. Then as that was a halakha that we don't have in the Mishnah, but he has that as a halakha, right? And then he says, and I received that as a tradition from Shmaya and Avtalio. In other words, that is an oral tradition that's not in the Mishnah. So in other words, now we know also that there are a lot of oral traditions that are not incorporated in the Mishnah. So you, now we see, just so we can tie all this together, each of these questions now are opening up through a cultural narrative. This is a kind of ideological myth, as it were. It's an ideological narrative which is trying to discuss different modes of authorizing Mishnah and showing the limits of a lot of cases, but that ultimately all of these reconstruct the Mishnah so the Mishnah is reauthorized now through every which way. So one of the concerns of the tradens is to authorize the oral tradition that came down in the Mishnah. And they've done it in every conceivable way, right? Through abstract logic, through biblical logic, through spontaneous tradition, and through the tradition of the earliest sages. And so, each one of these questions now, even the ironic question, like if you, would you be asking me these questions uh, if otherwise, or even the questions they would ask him, what are all these halachot, are all to reconstruct this new narrative. So then the question, I think that since you raised the epistemic question, um, from a cultural point of view, the historical accuracy 
is less significant than the cultural significance of this narrative, right? And as we could never reconstruct whether this was an actually historical event that took place with B'nai B'tera, or all of these episodes took place. But in rabbinic culture, it becomes a foundational myth. It's a founding myth, right? This is probably the founding myth of rabbinic authority because you're authorizing the Mishnah and you're showing multiple ways in which it can be reconstructed in an emergency. And they all reconfirm the teaching of the Mishnah, right? Which, to, in a certain degree, which is beyond logical reconstruction, right? Because originally it would just stand on its own. So I think that, you know, from the, I, I, I'd be curious, uh, Tal too, uh, who uh, does literature, but here you can see the reconstructed questions, the reconstructed dialogue, the reconstructed ironies, and the juxtaposition of forgetting, and the way the narrative unfolds cleverly. They first mention Shema and Aftalion. They don't use it as a legitimation. They immediately have him do the logic, right? The second time they bring it in is when he's rebuking the people and then he forgets the tradition. And then when the tradition is reconstructed from the ground up, then it is confirmed by Shema and Aftalion. So every single one of these intersecting things from a narrative point of view is brilliant. Then, you, if you wanted to then go on, you would see how the, school, the, 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 the law school tradition that follows this you know, has problems with some of the logical arguments that had appeared earlier. But this means that this text was given to, to law students for debate, and we simply have the collection of the law school debates that follow this. Yeah. Um, so if I'm just a foundational rabbinic myth, and I was wondering, and I love this, but to what extent the Talmudic discussion attempts to reconstruct the Mishnah, or on the other hand, it attempts to challenge and overcome the Mishnah as well, and so far... The which, which one? Would, who would be challenged? The, the, the Gemara? The Gemara, yeah. And so far, the, the Gemara is able to provide a, a clean solution to the problem which the Mishnah itself was not able to provide. I mean, how do uh, well, we, if we, but see, I, I would say we have the Mishnah, okay? So that's the clean solution to the cultural problem. If we have, if we lost it, could we reconstruct it? In other words, the real question that undoubtedly faces these cultural questions is if there is a break in the tradition, is everything lost? And they're now showing us that there are ways that you can reconstruct that pure tradition, which was the Mishnah. It's going to be even deeper tradition itself. I mean, yes, I agree. I agree. The, the fourth dimensional of the does not appear in the Mishnah. That seems to be like very, very I, I think in, in the end of the day, um, what's interesting is you don't simply, I mean, in a certain sense, it's a kind of a populist notion. In other words, you, don't simply have, you don't simply have to rely on God and the oral tradition. You don't simply have to rely on the sages. But human piety can reconstruct the lost tradition. So obviously, there's something maybe that was bothering the sages in Babylon who are constructing this narrative, and they're, they're trying to cross the bridge back to the land of Eretz Israel. But they're probably trying to deal with the problem, have, what if we lost the tradition? What if there was a gap and a break in the pure, sacred tradition and we don't know what to do? What are the alternatives? So I think that the, that the, the cultural problem 
that's opening up through these questions. And I think you're absolutely right. In the end, it goes even deeper than the mission. They're saying you can go even further than the oral tradition through spontaneous human piety, not even reasoning. It's a kind of a... It, by saying it's semi-prophecy means that the pious person intuitively knows what to do to obey the law even though they don't know the logic of it. Right? So... The fact that they add that on the end seems to add some populist dimension or to add what we didn't have before, a b'nai um, neviim, like this kind of semi-prophetic quality um, to this. Uh, but I think that the driving question that's projected into the community of b'nai Batira as an old city in the land of Israel is the question of a rabbinic tradition. What if there is a break? And um, how do we reconstruct the tradition of Eretz Israel, the land of Israel? That was the sages' tradition. And then the final thing is, of course, to say that none of this contradicts scripture. If we had to, we could go to scripture. But the main point is not simply to play with the language of scripture. It's to fill in the gap. Right? So understand what's, what's at stake here. Normal rabbinic logic, if you're reading the Gemara, is can you extend the ruling of the Mishnah because you perceive further life gaps that are not accounted for by the Mishnah. But here, we're not saying, can you extend the Mishnah because there are gaps that we need to extend to. We're saying that may have been a break in the fundamental tradition, right? It's a very different cultural problem. So I don't know, like in the, like in the Buddhist tradition, I mean, how would they, re how is that reconstructed if, it's, if there's a that's the big question. I mean, there's actually, there, there are, from the time that the, that the Buddha is supposed to pass away, I and mean, he didn't actually write anything right. down. And so the, the tradition was preserved totally as a moral tradition, but not, it didn't even start being. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it, it's, it, look, it, it becomes an issue. Look, I'll just give you uh, two more uh, clear indications um, uh, of that. So you have. Um, one of the strong issues that uh, begin in the 8th and 9th century, um, you have a type of what's called Kabbalah, the tradition, in the, uh, the Toldot Tanaim and Amoraim. So the problem that they face, which is also faced by Shrira Gaon, that's faced by uh, the Rambam and others, is that if you have controversy, machloket, does that mean that the tradition has been broken or you don't know the tradition? And the reason that the rabbis began to construct the purity of the tradition in the 8th and 9th century is because they were being challenged by the Muslims and the Karaites in precisely that period that you don't have the authentic tradition. You have machloket, you have controversy. If you have controversy and your tradition is filled with differences of opinion, there must be a break in your tradition. So the whole point of these later reconstructions of these, of the Toldot Tanaim um, Amoraim, of Igeret Shrir Gaon, of the Rambam and, and others, is to try to justify that, that differences of opinion don't make a break. It may just mean that they wanted to show different sides of the same coin. But that's simply, they're, they're, they are faced with the challenge of Islam which said, we have the pure tradition. And the Karaites said, no, we have the pure tradition. And the, ra the rabbinic logic can't have the pure tradition. As you can see, they're fighting over it. Right? So you see that what's at stake here is a huge cultural issue of the legitimation of authority and the stream of tradition. Right? That's what's so powerful. Yeah. Um, so I, I 
mean, it seems like if there's this um, possibility of people just through their piety basically recalling the tradition, which seems to be I mean, a very logical tradition, it's something that requires you know, a lot of quite a high intellect. So it almost seems like there's a, I think you used the word prophetic, it almost seems like a mystical. Well, that's the language that's used, that they have, if they're not prophets, they are semi-prophets. Im lo neviim heim, b'nei They have a kind of prophetic, in other words, they're inspired. Right. That, they, that the tradition, that those who are pious have within themselves in the oral tradition a kind of inherent truth that you trust them. That's so in the Middle Ages, it was called minhag, right? It was, that they're, it's, it's custom, that they, you can trust people to do all kinds of things that don't have a basis because they are bearers of the authentic tradition. So it's a unique feature of a culture of tradition. But it's also the huge crisis of a culture of tradition of what the danger of forgetting and the danger of gaps, right? We know that the danger of forgetting was already in the Dead Sea Scrolls. There was a huge issue that they, what they would mention, and also in the Hechalot literature, there was actually an angel called Sar HaShichacha, <laughs> the angel of forgetting, who would help you remember. If you knew the right magical... Form, you know, if everything depends not on computers, but on the oral tradition, the danger of an tr oral tradition being forgotten was huge. And that's what we're seeing here. And the questions in a very clever narrative form, that's why I'm emphasizing this, this is a, this is a pseudo-historical narrative, or maybe you shouldn't say, we'll say this in this privacy of this room. Uh, uh, but its effect is remarkable if you look at every single level, right, and you don't read this simply as piety, but as a real cultural problematic that is dealing with, what you say, with the epistemic validity of the tradition at every single level. And they, they, they're trying to do it through people asking sages and sages asking people. You know, you can see that it's... What's remarkable here is that the narrative is all dialogical and discourse-oriented. So you can really see, even though it's an artificially constructed narrative, how they imagined that discourse to have taken place to reconstruct it. Yeah. Two questions. Um, I'm going to go a little further than what else we said. I think at certain points they even Scripture itself, I mean, the Torah is not only the Mishnah. It, 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 it even recon, it, it contradicts Scripture itself, the Torah. You had certain kind of things. Yeah. Of the oral tradition contradicts Scripture in, in many cases uh, by its own logic. It's it's not, but the assumption is that the oral tradition is its legitimation. Right. Yeah. Well, go on. Go, go, go on further. So, my, again, I have this perhaps my personal obsession with uh, Islamic hierarchies. <laughs> this is the case, um, again, I'm not sure what's the aesthetic hierarchy, which brings me to the second question, is that if you have these highest democratic, semi-prophetic uh, people, yeah, they, origin and truth, what's the relation and uh, where is it placed in the aesthetic hierarchy related to the rabbinic logic? And uh, I don't know, I think we have, I feel we have like a lot of different competing uh, well, I think that I think that I think you're absolutely right, and I think that the, my answer is: look how they reconstructed this in a narrative way. In other words, they're not giving you a typology, and they're not giving you something abstract. They're giving you, as it were, a living case situation. And through discourse, and what's interesting here is that the discourse is not the discourse in the Talmud. The discourse in the Talmud gives you a window into what went on in the rabbinic law schools. Most of those discussions are purely hypothetical and they're reconstructed in kind of fixed logical terms. 
You don't, no one's hemming and hawing. Everybody speaks the same structure, right? It's a, it's a totally reconstructed series of law school notes. So, because, so that people who study this can reconstruct how to think rabbinically. But that, we're not being brought in to an academy where you see the rabbis, I'll present my argument, you present your argument, I'll present, and then you, can see, then you see the anonymous editor, the Stam, who brings it all together. Because then you simply, you, you, you know, he's the dean of the law school, so he brings it all together and he gives you a solution. But these are mostly hypothetical cases that would have been asked in a law school. Starting from this assumption, what's the basis of this law, where would you go with it, etc. It's, 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 it, we'd have to reconstruct it, but that's really all that's going on in the Talmud. But here, we don't have a law school debate. We have a cultural issue. We're right out, and that's what's so precious about this text. The questions are right out there, right? Um, and what's interesting, too, is that the generating question is to know we have a Tanaitic tradition Right? In other words, the Babylonian sages, are, I think the Babylonian sages are the ones who are struggling with this. And they are reconstructing a problem that they have. Right? Um, so, I, you're absolutely right. There are a number of alternatives. So it's not but but if, in other words, if you had, even the Mishnah would never go that far. In other words, it wouldn't say, this is the hierarchy of how you do it. Maybe Maimonides would go that way. He wants to yeah. tell you, this is the authority, and then you go down to, Ko, you know, to uh, Zakein Mamre, right down to the bottom. So you go down, now you know who can talk, when they can talk, how they can talk, what they can teach, when they can teach. Right? But he's giving you a code. What we have here is cultural narrative that's trying to give us a window into the cultural reconstruction of a theological problem. How do you serve God's will and not disobey when you haven't got the foggiest idea what to do? And they're somehow telling us this, you, you, can, you can fill in the gap. You can fill in the gap. And they narrate that. That if you lost that, and that everything in the, in the, and in the end of the day, that's what we knew from Shema Naftalion, even though we don't have that tradition in the mission at all. I mean, I, th I, th I think that this is such an amazing text from that point of view. It's, you know, it's what Malinowski used to like, like it's a charter. It's a cultural charter. I don't know that, I mean, you know, I mean myth in the, in the most dignified sense. I don't, mean, I don't mean it as a kind of a hypothetical. It's an attempt to, to allow us to see uh, into the deepest recesses of the rabbinic anxiety this is the, and the questions that are raised are the deepest questions of the anxiety of a culture of tradition and the fear of its loss and the presumption that it might have, that if we don't know it, we, we, we you know, are we lost or can we reconstruct it? And I think that's part of what we're seeing played out in a remarkable narrative. So I think that the I think my, my only answer to you, and I know that it's satisfying, is that the whole text is an epistemic, is a mentalite. The whole text is an, it's, a, it's, a, it's a structure of mind. And they're playing out an inner discourse. The whole text is, a, is, a, is an epistemic structure. Does that help at all? I mean, I, I, don't, I can't go farther than that. Because I don't, I don't want to, I, you know, I want to keep the text that's before us. Uh, in its own logic and its own power. So it was up, it was up for grabs, basically. It was still very close um, but in the end of the day, um, um, lots of ways to um, build a bridge over the over the gap. Yeah. Now it's it's what's interesting. Um, that no one says here um, that they reconstructed the Mishnah. Uh, you know, no one cites the Mishnah. Mm -hmm. 
No one at the end of the day is citing the Mishnah. I mean, yeah. I, so, so in the end, you know, the there's no one who's going to come back. They, they forgot it, but no one is. And when they say Shemayin and Aftalion, they're not saying that they have the tradition that we have in the Mishnah, right? So in the end of the day, they're trying to present this on its own terms, um, perhaps on the notion that the Mishnah had not yet been constructed or was complete at that point, but there were floating traditions and hadn't been solidified. It's not even the case that, I mean, usually you'd have this battle with the Gemara when there's another mission that contradicts our mission. This is not even that case. Yeah. It's just another Mishnah tradition yeah. trying to prove the same point from different sources. I mean, I think a case like, cases like this that reflect these extraordinary um, issues. Uh, Svi's did a reconstruction on the basis of certain logical issues, and there's some points that we have here, um, and that is, is a very strong analysis but we're getting to the deeper cultural unconscious here. And I don't know that there are very many other cases in the whole corpus that get to the cultural unconscious in such a powerful way. The anxiety. Yeah, the cultural anxiety, yeah. So, um, earlier we had the question of the, the study. Uh, and you mentioned the fact that the mysterium has not... Implicit. But in the Hebrew, it's mysterion. It's mysterion in, in the Hebrew, yeah. but it's the mysterion in the Greek. Mysterion. Um, and you refer to the... Um, um, to... to uh, uh, indicating the fact that the mysterion is not directly related or doesn't attempt to kind of connect the oral tradition to the Torah itself, or rather from kind of... The, the question is being asked, do we have something distinct? Right? We know, for example, if you look in Midrash of the Mechilta of Rabbi Ishmael, since this is at the time of Passover, the big decision is the, the, the Sabbath and the blood on the doorpost, or whether, and the contention over the blood and the circumcision. And then there was the contention over the Sabbath. So the final point of issue of whether the rabbis have their own unique tradition finally fell on the oral tradition. And that may, as some suggest, that may be the reason why the rabbis so consistently keep that distinct from the... They, they, keep, no, they keep its logic separate from the from the written tradition to yes. preserve it in, in, in their group. But it seems like what happens is, so this is also, yes, as I recall, for example, as I said earlier, in the sense of the cross and the fact that we're trying to, in some right. direction, that are detached from the actual, the, from the European. Right. But then it's like, it seems like later on, it's attempt both on, on, on behalf of the uh, early fathers of the church and also on behalf of, of the rabbis to kind of speak again about the study. I'm not sure whether or not in this rate, and not at this particular term of the this discussion that it's only through the secret that we can actually enter uh, and really understand yeah. the, the, the written to us well through the oral, oral tradition. So this kind of way can to return back through the oral tradition and link it back to the Well, they're saying the same thing, that the, that oral tradition is the, is, the, is the rabbinic truth. It's the distinctive rabbinic truth. If everybody now has the Old Testament, what is the distinctive tradition? Uh, whether that tradition itself is a mystery would depend on whether you're in rabbi- certain rabbinic circles or mystical circles and so on and so forth. Right. But that's a, that's a much uh, more thing. Anybody ha- have any other literary or cultural question that you want to raise in relation to this? I'm, I, as you saw, I was, just try- I was trying to focus on the questions that the questions become kind of open set... Uh, ways of opening up into this deeper cultural um, issue rather than questions just hanging there on their own. And each one pushes it a little bit more radically. It's not entirely related, but um, in the Talmud and Bhagavad Gita 39b... Why don't you fill everybody else in? Um, what is it? Yeah. Um, the Talmud and Bhagavad Gita 39b, and the Talmud and Bhagavad Gita 39b, and the Talmud and Bhagavad Gita 39b, and the Talmud and Bhagavad Gita 39b, 
But um, that's where, uh, yeah, the result is that effectively every attempt for exegesis is given to the sages. It's 59, 59. 39. Well, we'll check, okay. Anyway. Uh, I'll look for us. Yeah, okay. Um, yes, they're not, they're not even concerned with scripture. They're not even concerned with God. They're concerned only with the authority and the... So that, you know, so that becomes a different issue. In other words, that beco- that's an issue that arose in the church fathers in the 4th and the 5th century. Um, is the final issue miracles or is the issue cultural logic and tradition? And when the rabbis go with tradition against miracles, we know that that was a pushback among the church fathers too. Uh, they didn't want to go with miracles. Because once you go with just miracles, you can't have a stable church tradition. Right? That thing actually is much earlier in the Montanist debate. We know, we, anyway, I, I, I would take this too far away. But I'm just saying that, that that would be another indication where there's an, iris, uh, there's an issue of authority that, you're right in that sense, there's an issue that arises of authority. Um, and then it, but now it's making a choice, um, uh, and then they have that choice legitimated through God. It's you're really by not. Self, self-defeating. What? You're you're saying that it's a uh, it's a choice as distinct from like a retrieval of lost knowledge. Yeah, it's different from that. Yeah, yeah. In this case, is if you have a stalemate, which would be the decisive way. And one way is, you know, human voting and the majority, the A's get it. And the other is if God does a miracle. And so the, and the argument is, no, it's Lo Shemai. It's, 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 scripture is not any more in heaven. It has to be debated and solved as well, a miracle. But, but, but that's a very, it's, it's related, but it's no, not. But, but, but I think the point is, for me, is that it changes the structure of the, of the question in the yeah. sense that it redirects it right. and cannot point beyond. Right? It must remain within yeah. the boundaries of the yeah. Yeah. So this, this, this issue, and it's also, I think, an issue that he raised in his paper, um, focusing on boundary questions is a very fascinating cultural problematic. We have issues taken to the boundary, and then you see what's at stake. And we have a lot of other kind of cases which deal with um, uh, boundary issues, but um, not, you know, okay. they're not always a clutch question. It's, it's, it's kind of focus on what is a boundary. This, uh, this is bringing from my knowledge a, a Buddhist approach to knowledge and authority. Um, actually, you mentioned epistemic authority, and I think it, it's considered like when they when they debate. When they kind of do a logical debate, which I'll do a presentation on, um, one of them, the, the, the distinction between, it's considered really sort of almost like a cheap shot if you come in with, with scriptural authority, although that's considered the ultimate proof. Because of, you're not trusting on the, on the sage? Yeah, because you're not relying on, on wisdom that's generated from a kind of from a logical analysis. If you say, oh, well, the Buddha said this, Therefore, it's true. It just sort of stops the discussion. It's like, yeah, of course, it's true because the Buddha said that he's got some authority. But really, we have to be able to arrive at that through the process of reasoning and logic. This is, I mean, this is obviously from a, from a Buddhist point of view, but it seems like there's a kind of parallel. Well, certainly, certainly in the Tibetan tradition, yeah, and certainly in the tri- Tibetan tradition, where the school tradition is like a rabbinic yeshiva, where they, the main issue is screaming and yelling and grabbing each other by the collar and saying, I'm right and you're wrong. <laughs> and you know, that, is, that, is, that is the test of whether you have, whether you, you, can, you have your own authority. In other words, in, a, in certain cultures of tradition, um, you, part of the, you want to be part of the tradition, but you also want to be self-standing, that you can do it on your own. Prophetic in the sense that anything of any nature has to be justifiable or rational, in a way that is not parallel or anything to anything 
Right, right. And how you reconstruct, you know, how, how it's then presented. I mean, there's a lot to do with the narrative form of presentation, that it's not simply, I mean, you have hierarchy, but, the, but you have this problematic of what is the true hierarchy and how do, you, how do you display that? That's part of what's interesting is how it's displayed. Um, so I think the narrative the stylistic question, maybe we'll have Tal will be able to fill us in at some later point. But I think that the, I'm not sure, um, you know, beyond this dialogical aspect, um, you know, the, what the best way, you know, of using this as a way uh, of, of a, cul a cultural, a prism of culture, that's really what we have here, you know, quite quite remarkable um, sense. All right, so maybe we'll stop with that. I, um, I think that, we, that opens up really a lot of, of interesting issues of, of how these questions are working to keep open the problematic, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, over in the history of tradition. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, I think that that yeah, that itself would be, uh, you know, look, look, the the problem really starts, and you can you can see. I think it's it's, um, it's chapter four in the Tosefta. So you can already begin to see the earliest the earliest attestation of this in an in a smaller form is Tosefta Psachim. I think it's Dalit. So go back and take a look at it. Then you can really, that's, a, that's actually the core of this. And then the Mish, the, the tradition was elaborated um, as well. So it's really a very early um, discussion. But there's some interesting variations in the Tosefta. Tosefta is um, uh, a mar it's not really, it, it's, it's another one of the rabbinic uh, legal traditions, but it was not codified as the Mishnah, but it's a kind of a supplement to it. It's a much larger discussion of, of how it stands in relation to the Mishnah, which we can't go into here. So what I would like to do now, um, since um, Tal was so gracious, um, uh, we'll get to the text in Baba Kama, but Tal actually, uh, maybe, maybe we can take a, we'll wait till everybody comes back, give it a, a minute or so, but the interesting thing was that um, instead of being an analysis of only one text, you did a, a, a theological and legal comparison between uh, punishments and penalties in Job and punishment and penalties in Baba Kama. So it was a really a beautifully creative cultural juxtaposition. So I want to maybe we'll just wait a second until everybody comes back. Do we need to go around? Out? We, we can take this, huh? Is it a formal break? Or? Yeah, let's take a three-minute form, a three-minute formal break. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. On that kind of a text? Yeah. Or um, was that text specifically? Um, 
No, because there you're dealing with a very technical halachic problem of purity and impurity. Yeah. And they don't know which way to go. The, the issues of authority and the role of the Holy Spirit and the role of logic is different in the church. Right. I, um, I, don't, I don't know of a text that's exactly of that type. Okay. Um, because that's really focusing on a very technical, legal question. So that was just your insight? Yeah. Okay. Oh, you mean between the um, of miracles? Yeah. No, there, is, there was an article written in the Hebrew Union College Annual in the 1950s on the 4th and 5th century and the tension in the church between rationality and, um, uh, and miracles. The same issue arises, I, I was alluding to it, in the 1st century there was a debate in the church, it was a famous debate called the Montanist controversy. And what happened was, there's oh, some group, M-O-N-T-A-N, uh, yeah. So the Montanist issue was that the authority should rely on the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And the church fathers strongly pushed back against that because in order to build ecclesiastical authority it, has to if you, it had to be based on a synod of discussion. Right. If the final decision is always a matter of Holy Spirit, you end up with a charismatic society and you can't have a structured society. So there, um, uh, Professor Ephraim Urbach once uh, wrote an essay called Matai Pascha Nevoa. So when did prophecy cease? So we know that there are a number of discussions in rabbinic literature that the final prophets were Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. We have that in Avot the Rabbi Natan, etc., etc. But it appears that the pushback against, in other words, it says, it says, Chacham Adif Mi Navi, that a, a rabbinic sage is preferable to a prophet. Um, and Nachum Glatzer and other in the, uh, in the um, Journal of Religion from 1946 already wrote an essay on that problem that the notion of a rabbinic sage is preferable to a Navi is precisely at the time of the Montanist controversy. Again, it seems to be things that are going on. You can't establish rabbinic authority if you have if you have charismatic authority of the Ruach HaKodesh of the Holy Spirit. So we do know that the whole tradition of the Holy Spirit continued even later. Josephus refers to that in the Middle Ages, the return of the Holy Spirit. Even, the, even in rabbinic times, the hope for the return of the, of the Holy Spirit um, in the Messianic days. But the authorities pushed back against that in the church and rabbinic times because you couldn't have a legal normative society if the ultimate authority could be say, well, I, 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 you know, I, I, received I, I, I received the spirit and you're wrong, right? Is, but did, sorry, I was just curious, did, did in, in the Hebrew Union College, or, or that, did, they, did they, uh, ref, like, it There, it brings in some of the, it brings in Tertullian and some of the other church fathers from the uh, fifth century. And does it, does it bring in the, the, uh, narrative, the narrative element from the oven of a high. No, 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 no. Uh, uh, he he brings that in as a counterpoint, okay. right? And because because and and other kinds of cases, you know, of proving things by miracles, and there seems to be a strong pushback against, against proof against by miracles. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. In the right hand? Nobody reads it. I mean, you guys usually read the first paragraph. Right. But and then just save to the last uh, chapter. Yeah, nobody yeah. reads it. It's exactly about that. About Wait, the, uh, where? Phil Pope, Phil Leviathan, about the about authority. But, but yeah. where in the It's on, uh, I think, part two in religion, where he talks about the, 
he talks about it from a political perspective of the problematic, of the, how problematic it is to accept miracles as a source of any sort of knowledge and authority, and therefore you have to sort of separate in time an age of miracles and an age that's different. And the interesting thing is that actually he's not quite saying that either, where he is, that the only miracle and the only voice of God in the East Age is uh, the state. Yes. The state itself. You that right. is the yeah. voice of God, and that is the only miracle, and that's it. And nothing else. The philosophication of Lobo You call it a miracle? <laughs> he said, yeah. actually, that's the will of God. He, um, I can look exactly for this, but the manifestation of the will of God in his time is the state. Yeah, I don't know enough about that, but I would imagine that the part of the tradition of the body of the king and that the ruler has particular types of authority and so on and so forth that's coming down from the Middle Ages. The king has two bodies, right? There's a whole long of, of, of how you would establish a ruler having... Um, well, I think it's a redistribution of power to say it comes from the body, from the body of the people and not from a sovereign. Like so people, the people are attributing it, yes. Yeah. Yeah, the, the people. There's a willing. There's a willing suspension by the people for the sake of the rule of the. Right. 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 That's not hopes. That's a post-hopes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we have a lot of political post, ex, political theorists here. So what I'd like to do before we take a quick look at the Baba Kama material, um, which I hope we'll get to, I. I I do want a towel to read, and read it slowly so that, because people, uh, Maxim is, uh, unfortunately, thinks in Russian. <laughs> so are we all? Uh, but but, uh, but I, I think that this, I, this will allow us to kind of bring a certain kind of closure because it creates a, theolo- a, a very interesting juxtaposition between a theological text and a legal text. Okay. Um. And I use the apologetic language because I wasn't sure that I actually understood Baba Kama at all, so please excuse the apologetic language, <laughs> as I just do now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> in Baba Kama chapter 8, the question seeks to get to the bottom of physical payback. That is to say, when harm is done to an individual, how is one to repay the debt? I would like to explore how the nature of this debt compares to the physical, emotional, and mental harm inflicted upon Job by God. While in Baba Kama, the questions revolve around the what and how of repaying a physical debt, it seems that the questions of the book of Job are interested in the question, why? Job suffers great depreciation and physical pain. He does not ask, where should I seek repayment? Rather, Job seeks to understand, why am I the target of such misfortune? Job's acquaintances stand before him, before him in a series of arguments. His true, in, uh, Job's, while Job's acquaintances stand before him in a series of arguments, his true interlocutor is God, and Job is wondering, "Why me? What is the rhyme and reason for the misfortune that has befallen me?" Which leads to an even greater question of why anything. Thus, the nature of the questions appear to be different. It seems the questions asked in Job are metaphysical whereas the questions in Baba Kama are practical. If one does this, then they should repay like so. In Baba Kama, the debates are fruitful precisely because they deal with the practical and the mundane. Each predicament gives rise to a more lucid understanding of the scenario because the nature of the questions deal with practical actions of the day-to-day. The questions are not about the meaning of life itself, but rather about how to resolve a practical issue in a practical way as it lines up with scriptural decree. In chapter 28 of Job, a, met- a metaphysical question is posed. But where can wisdom be found? Where is the source of understanding? In contrast to the practical questions of Baba Kama, this question probes for transcendental truth. The question asks for the source of understanding, or in other words, the ultimate tool with which to grasp and comprehend all there is. In Baba Kama, the thrust is valuative. If X is taken away, how can one repay X back? Depending on the loss, depending on the loss, perhaps two X payment is necessary, and so forth. What is meant by eye for an eye? That payment should be made in the form of one eyeball for an injured eye, 
the thinkers in Babakama seem to avidly attempt alternate understandings of this statement. The consensus falls along the lines of value payments. That is to say, if one harms a slave, the value is not the eye of the slave, but the eye of the offender, or the value of the eye of the offender. But can this question be asked of God himself? If he, in capital H, costs Job, Job his children, his property and his health, how can he, God, repay the loss? The questions of the book of Job work not to answer this question, but to prove its invalidity. What we learn in Job is our limited ontology. Our scope of being is nowhere near the understanding of God's orchest orchestrated creation. The human point of view is not one that is privileged. In the same way that God created an ostrich, who lacks the wisdom to lay her eggs in safety, God has created humans to exist, but not to understand. The ostrich lays her eggs in the hands of danger, and when they are trampled, does not ask why. The book of Job teaches humans the realm in which to play, not the metaphysical, but the practical, the realm of Babakama. This is corroborated in the logical nature of the different questions. In Babakama, the reasoning is deductive. One question gives rise to a new question through the rules of deduction, tracing the logic of one situation to the next. From this, an answer could potentially, or rather, in theory, be, re be reached. In other words, if enough scenarios are described, there should be a deduction that takes them all into consideration and yields an answer of how to act in any given circumstance. In the book of Job, by contrast, what comes to light is the fallacy of inductive reasoning. That is to say, just because things have worked out so far in one's pious existence does not mean they are doing so because of some divine rule or natural order. The sun rises every day because God commanded the day to break. The logic here implies that in the same way he commanded day to break, he can also command eternal night. The book of Job rattles the crutch that is inductive reasoning. Job was lost in the metaphysics of his circumstances and was only redeemed when he realized the fallacy of his original question, why? Human knowledge should not assume, as was the folly of Job, but should deduce using practical understanding. At the end of the day, our lives are to be passed in the day-to-day -day amongst others. Our journey is a very palpable ontological question. The end. Thank you. Anybody want to... Uh... It's beautiful English, too. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so I think that juxtaposition of the issue of the AI, it occurred to me just to this time. I think, let me just, do we have the syllabus? I think the, yeah. the last text that we're going to be dealing with, I, uh, I think it's the Levinas text. Mm -hmm. Yeah, damages due to fire uh, actually answers your issue. It takes a text from Baba Kama and God destroys the uh, city of Jerusalem and then it requires God to pay recompense at the end. So you'll see that how it actually picks up on your problem and tries to give at least one case uh, where um, that challenge is made that the, the destroyer actually has to make recompense for the destruction. Um, so uh, clearly the rabbis were thinking that issue, at least in that one an extraordinary case, and then Levinas, as we'll see, brings that in connection with the Holocaust. But um, there's a question of whether there can be any notion of theodicy or retribution. So we're going to end it sort of linking back to the book of Job as we started, but we'll see that he actually picks up on, uh, on a problem that arises in the law of Baba Kama. So let's see. Yeah. I was wondering, um do you see a radical one's own relationship to his own self and to his own loving or not so? 
Well, I don't know, but I think that in, uh, in, in my reading here, the understanding is that the, or even what we just wrote, read in Sahim is that the, these actions have to, by definition, be technical and not moral, if that makes any sense. So the, the legal aspect is... But we'll see that the moral issue is part of what generates the problematic of, the, uh, of coming to legal solutions, right? Right. I mean, in other words, in other words that, that issue of some form of equivalence is a notion of justice as some form of equivalence. So there's a moral right. aspect. Right, but the question is, like, are there some... Is religion equated to the legal... I should more explicit. I mean, I don't, I don't see this going to be as problematic and so far. It's going to be with regard to this particular uh, city of the trust. It's not concerned with regard to one's own well being, one's capital, one's own. You know, what do I get in return to my offspring and so far? Rather, it has to do with legal aspects of the ritual way I kind of carry out my own kind of day to day. Whereas, what we're coming more like religion, so to speak, religious discourse, focuses and, and addresses in terms of what the way I just claim my own dominance, uh, um, from I claim, I claim to determine my own well being through a different religious kind of uh, myth that much of means. And that would seem to be not problematic, I would say, kind of put. Yeah, because you're saying because Job is uh, materialistic in a different way. Job he loses everything. Job Chan, through the reading of Job, one, through the reading of Job, one wonders whether the deep theological experience um, challenges my own, my very claim for my own little bit. Now, since that. I do, not need, I, do not, I do not need to let and I do not need to have materials to means I have to go, but rather the place and the significance of those that means, uh, the significance of the place with regard to with regard to the question, how do I experience my own being uh, realistic in terms of the philosophical thing to engage with large yeah. See, I mean, part of the issue is, it's a, I mean, raising it, it's a, it's a hard issue between the two because the problematic, you raise in terms of the pragmatics, but the problem in Baba Kama is between individuals, when one person has harmed another individual, um, what insurance claim can you have? What claim for, re- for damages can you make and how do you get damages? Uh, wh- what is, so in other words, there, it's, it is on the basis, uh, and it's, what's interesting here, there's nothing discussed there about intention or n- lack of intention, right? Even in that whole discussion, it's not as if like, you would expect like accidental, right. like what, what if a person takes out a person's eye because they're chopping wood and a piece of wood goes into their eye, right? In other words, it's interesting that they don't get to that issue of accidental or sort of um, uh, consequences, uh, but, the, but it's, it's at the practical level that you know that so-and-so injured so-and-so, and what are the claims that one could make on another? But I think that, um, I think where Tzvi's question is, is coming from, is to, the, and it's where you were talking about, is do, does, does the human being have the right to have any claims towards the universe? Are there any, are there, are there any reasons that would give a person the right to make those claims, right? Um, now you could say one reason to make those claims, the tradition said that God rewards and punishes. But it's interesting that the book of Job 
doesn't begin with citing Sefer Devarim in the book of Deuteronomy. So, in other words, you could say, I have, my problem arises because it says somewhere that I have a claim, right? Uh, we don't know how he comes to that assumption except by some kind of magical thinking that if he keeps his rituals together, everything will work well. And he has a certain kind of a claim, um, not against perfection, but against disproportion. Mm -hmm. His logic claim is against disproportion, right? That um, he can't understand. So it's not so much that he has a claim against the universe, but the universe seems not to have any proportion in relationship, or the divine as the will behind the universe has no logical or legal accountability. So he's asking for accountability in a certain sense. So at that level, there is a symmetry between the law demands accountability or responsibility. And Job's question begins, it arises out of reasons we don't know. Does he have reason for accountability? Does he have reason to call God to give any answer? Right? Does he have any claims that things should go in a certain way? Uh, based on what? Right? Um, even, uh, is it, uh, he, it's interesting that he doesn't simply make claim that of the natural order, right? He's, he's not like looking that there is natural law and then there is, I'm, I'm out of whack with natural law. So there are, there are aspects where this issue arises, but the... Um, Uh, I think you're absolutely right to, to bring to the fore in this kind of a context that a, a, a society can't dispense with a public notion of what accountability and responsibility is so that otherwise you'd have no sense of restraint, right? You have to have some structure for that. Um, uh, the, you know, the book of Job's problem is um, does, a, does obedience to the law give one any special privilege in the universe? Right? Or is obedience um, simply something that one must do for the truth of doing it but not because it gives you any claims over the universe? No. Obviously, the history of religion is filled with people who feel that they have a right to make a claim. That's what makes it. Or their sorrow is predicated on, you know, why should a good person have, suffer an issue? That, that already presumes that people think that they have some kind of a claim, right? I mean, just to, even to say, you know, tzaddik viralo, that a person is, is righteous and that bad things happen. Bad things happen to good people. Even to formulate it that way, in the end of the day, the book of Job says that's an, that's an insane question. Uh, just to kind of follow up on this issue, yeah. I think, well, I think what you're today will be like very interesting to examine what, to what extent a constitution of, say, a legal structure um, requires a suspension of the creative theological questions, mm -hmm. uh, which, have, which seems to happen with regard to this example of how this is a joke. And what, on the one hand, on the other hand, what I stand for, and what I stand for, and what say, an influence of the creative theological uh, issues, the non of creative theological issues, to what extent, for example, that in our influence of those issues on the constitution of the legal structure in the Bahá'í. 
So the tension between the three different structures. There are often different relations between the two. That's what you're going to see where you have that. Yeah, I mean, I think it's um, the very asymmetry can allow you to think through the problem in a slightly different way, but we have to recognize the deep asymmetry. Um, and there's also, Joe begins with no knowledge. He has, he has a presumption. Um, the notion of presumption is not an issue in a legal society. Right. You know, you see what takes place. I mean, the, the whole basis of this is pr- presumes good evidence for bringing the culprit to trial. Because we don't have the discussion here, well, did you have witnesses? Did he really do it? Did it happen by unintended consequences? That's all involved, right? Did witnesses see him do it? Is he the one who really did it? Um, I only saw him take his arm like that, but maybe someone threw something from another side of the room. So those are all the issues of what, uh, uh, that you'd have to resolve. But once this text gets going, it's trying to determine, as we'll see in a second, the, the, the very the complicated issue of the presumption of a judge. I think that's where, what we're going to see in the Baba Kama text. You know, the, the enormous uh, discretion that a judge has to make estimations. And so this text is really a kind of a cautionary legal document to try to help a judge have guidelines. I mean, this is what the law calls kind of bright line law, right? It's trying to give certain advice. As we'll see, as you go through, you can see it's giving, this is a text that's given to judges so that they have a little notebook and they say, well, uh, what is the range of my discretion? And then the, the students are always saying, well, this is an absurd assumption. What if this is the case? What if that's the case? Right? Now, they're trying to respond to the presumptions that the, the way the mission will begin is it's trying to, to rationalize or make ra- reasonable the presumptions of a judge. Right? And then the students or the discussion goes wild because they're trying to find out is there any basis you know, for these presumptions or is there any basis for not following the more primitive notion of talion, of ayin tachat ayin. You know, you know, the culture seems to have made a shift towards rationality. And what is, can we support it? You know, that the shift to rationality, what's called mamon, namely um, monetary compensation, as opposed to mamash, namely uh, physical damages, that took place probably sometime in the oral tradition in the past. And that now they're trying to kind of see whether that has any le- legitimation. I mean, that, that's clearly a moral decision that was made, um, rejecting a certain kind of primitive eye for eye tradition in the law. Um, and this it's interesting that this legitimation is is much later and is arguing the thing. I mean, they don't... The easiest solution would have been if they simply said that eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth are simply metaphors for finding the proper equivalence in monetary terms. They just say it's a metaphor. Right? But you, But somehow the decision to move towards non-retaliatory or money is a, is, a, is a payback, but it's not violent, right? It's not violent in that sense. But you see, the rabbis are still dealing with these weird discussions. Well, what if you could tolerate the pain? I mean, that's an insane discussion, but we'll see, they're trying 
to wonder, uh, you know, have, have we gone, you know, is the, is, the, is the shift against primitive talion justice legitimate? And I think that the rabbis made that shift way in the past, and we have no record when they made that decision. And what's evidence that they don't have any record is they could, our discussion could have just nipped the whole thing in the bud by saying ayin tachad ayin and chain tachad chain, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Those are just metaphors. You don't take them literally, and you just say, this is just a metaphor for saying that we have to find a proper equivalence in all cases. And then the whole problem is solved. And you say, and we do this now through our contemporary form of compensation. And the whole problem, the fact that they never use an argument like that, which is the most sensible and simple argument, means that this was made so far in the past that no one had any way you know, of dealing with it. You know, we don't, it just goes back uh, uh, in the... Um, anyway, yeah. He was... No, it no, didn't take it. So, it was a question, I think, for 20 minutes ago. Uh, All right, so we don't have to go back 20 minutes ago. <laughs> I think... Um, I wrote this on my response, but I think part of it is that uh, using metaphors to go very much against the uh, analytic ethos of the uh, analytic ethos that of the Talmud, which was a very important thing and for the formation, the, again, the application uh, of the knowledge to a rhetoric of exhausting every possible objection and of uh, going analytically to a subject. But you could, you could, you could, you could, okay, I'm sorry. Okay. The last thing I want to say is that yeah. I think and this might not be true, but it's very important to compare this and contrast this with the uh, Christian justification of knowledge because the use of metaphors of saying something represents something else in the sense of the mimesis, like in, uh, in the hour of the sense of the mimesis, is something that was not justifiable for the writers of the Talmud, and I think it's very important to have something justified again analytically and not metaphorically, it's it's it's. Uh, it's not I, I, I I accept what you're saying, uh, but I'm just saying that you could have done that analytically. All you all 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 the first teachers would have had to say was by finding a meta principle, bechayvahim. Right? You simply say that the the purpose. Um, is to have compassion, and the purpose is to to end the cycle. Let's say they could even say the purpose is not to have a cycle of retaliation against lotikom velotito. And since that's the principle of Moses, he teaches us that the only way to stop that cycle is to do compensation. I mean, there are ways well, you could make you could, wait, you, could, you could make the analytic argument on the basis of certain moral principles. You have to as you have to go you have to go meta, right? It, 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 but going meta doesn't mean that you can't have um, conceptual analysis. You have to go someplace. To say going meta is also to say this me is literal. That's going meta. How do I read this text? Okay. It's presumably if they're saying compensation, they are possibly reading it metaphorically. They're not saying so. They're simply saying the only way we could apply this is to make monetary estimations of equivalence. And then that raises new problems. And presumably that's how they got there, but we don't just don't have the reasoning. Where if it says apodictically, I ain't mamon. Now the issue is like, you say mamon, I say mamon. <laughs> um, a comment and a question. I mean, first there are exceptions. And for example, with the case of Adim um, Zolimim, for example, you do exactly what they plan to do. Right. Well, that's the text is brought in. And, and right, and, 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 and yet you don't get money as a consequence. 
money is not equivalent to to Right, right. Yeah. So, yeah, it's interesting that, yeah, okay. Well, that's a good point. That's I'm, I'm wondering, when you say moral and justice and ethics, what exactly do you mean? Because my concern here is, again, the question of authority. I mean, it, if it looks like a justice or moral system, it doesn't mean that it is a moral justice system. It acts like it, but the source of authority is not morality. So while I agree that there's somewhat of a difference between Baba Kama and the Book of Job, I think the distinction is much more radical. Right? It's not only a distinction between theological and ethics, if that's the way you want to put it. I'm not even sure how to put it myself, but I don't think that Baba Kama is concerned with ethics. I mean, it looks no, like no, it's, 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 it's concerned it's just, with trying, as we'll see in a second, they want to know what the terms mean so that you know how to apply it. Right? Um, they need to know, and they're trying to establish a defensible, rational structure to jurisprudence. And they are faced with two issues. You know, a principle that appears to be an economic principle, and a principle that seems to be divine, that is that uh, appears to be absolutely intolerable, right? The, the principle of uh, physical um, uh, compensation. So uh, they're trying they're trying to square the circle by turning an ir- what appears to them to be irrational or in- unpalatable into a rational structure of the law, right? So, but it's a, different, it's a different form. Let me just give you one other example and we'll go that. I, I mean, this is one of the cases that, for example, that, that Halbertal, Halbertal doesn't bring this, but in Halbertal in his book, Ahalacha um, Behit Habutan, so the case of the changes in halacha. So if you take a case of the Sota, of a case where a, fa- a, 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 a husband can bring charges against his wife s- simply because he may just be insanely jealous and draw all kinds of presumptions. Or the law that the father has, um, uh, can, um, you know, can bring damages against a child that he thinks is acting improperly towards them, right? So what he actually shows that the purpose of the law in those cases is to take the situation out of the hands of irrational behavior and try to put it into a court where you have formal structures. Now those formal structures may or may not be always the best, but by putting it into a neutral zone of law and out of the hands of psychological quirks, like you know, an re- irrational father towards his son, an irrational husband towards his wife, at a certain point, the rabbinic society rejected the, the implications of irrational authority. Right of a husband or a father, it's a it's a it's an absolute repudiation of family authority and puts family authority into the hands of the courts. Right now, the court may or may not uh, act fully r- right in those cases, and we say in the case of the accused, why well, they had to reject that law as well because of certain kind of embarrassments. But I just but the but the main but the main but the main issue here is that I think the same way in this particular case, um, the case of damages is an absolute repudiation of, of divine law on the basis of certain kind of moral principles. But that's an intolerable way for them to formulate it, right? It has to be formulated by this is the true meaning of the text. But it is a it is an absolute repudiation of the biblical text, um, on the assumption the biblical text could never have meant that. I mean, I'm not 
right? So you do. So the assumption is that you're moving on a scale of of rationality which has public interest.